You're watching LMCC. All right, who went to Clear Spring School? One, two, three, four, five. Okay, whose kids went to Clear Spring School? Yeah, a few more. Thank you all, to all my neighbors who showed up tonight. <laughs> I will be serving brunch on Sunday to pay you back. Does anyone have one of these buttons? No? I really want one. Yeah. There is one in the, um, in the Excelsior Lake Minnetonka Historical Society collection. That's really why I volunteered, because one day I'm just going to lift it. <laughs> and it'll go back to Clear Spring School where it belongs. Just kidding. I've learned I'm not supposed to do those things. All right. So the history of this school is not unusual. We're, I'm not here to tell you something really fabulous and, and unique. I'm here to tell you the story of a rural school in America, very similar to probably most others, although I haven't done a lot of comparison. Um, Probably very similar. But um, it's a story like a lot of rural schools, steeped in the importance of education um, to the settlers in the area, full of pride in their community, and built with the hard work of the educators and sacrifice of parents. So I thought it was a story worth telling. And the first kids on the grounds of Clear Spring School were probably Native American children searching for berries and nuts and their families would travel up and down this path um, to hunt and fish, probably moving from Lake Minnetonka to Lotus Lake, uh, according to some folks at Hennepin County. Um, that trail eventually was used by settlers and traders and eventually became Highway 101. And please don't speed on Highway 101. <laughs> Sorry. Um, who knows what year John McKinsey built a log cabin nearby in, in that area? Mr. John McKenzie. It was 1854. What year did Minnesota become a state? 1858. Okay, so there were settlers here a lot earlier than I originally thought. And along with John McKenzie was a man by the name of Cordell. Soon after, his brother followed him along, along with the Zimmer family and many others from a province along the Rhine River in Prussia, which for those of you who don't know is now part of Germany. And people came from other faraway places to settle, to have uh, land in this beautiful area we call Minnetonka. And as families settled along that old trail, of course they had a church, they pulled a congregation together, and then they soon wanted a school for their children. Um, of course, not this building, not this building at first. Um, Maybe they just want to get the kids out of the house, too. <laughs> OK. Before I get started, and I'm sorry you can't see this a little better, I need to thank Mrs. Donna Hicks. Because um, does anyone here know Donna? I know some of you do. Know Donna and her husband, Larry. OK. So in 1981, Clear Spring School decided to celebrate their, what they thought at the time was their 100th anniversary. And at that time, the school's earliest history was really unknown. It was thought that the school started about 1880 in what we now know was the second building, um, not the first. But Donna and her husband Larry, um, if you've seen here and also seen here as a Clear Spring School student in the 1930s, um, they started planning a celebration. Donna was a library aide, she was a PTA member, a room mom coordinator, and um, so she dived right in into helping to create a, a celebration. Uh, side note, Larry liked to tell the story of how classmates were, did some trapping, and when they didn't want to stay in school that day, they'd put a dead skunk in the heating vent. <laughs> but uh, Donna and Larry lived in the neighborhood. Their kids went to school at Clear Springs. And when they dist uh, started collecting materials for a historical display to celebrate the 100th anniversary, they came across notes from the day the school was chartered with Hennepin County. And that year was 1867, not 1880. So really, they were about to celebrate the 114th anniversary. 
Their celebration drew 1,200 people to an old-fashioned ice cream social uh, in May of 1981. And about 35 years later, the phone rang at my house because I had moved into the neighborhood, and Donna was calling to say, would you approach the current principal and ask if um, you could you know, work up a celebration for the 150th anniversary? And uh, she knew I had kids there at school, and she knew I was interested in history. So her daughter brought over a scrapbook that they had prepared for the 114th anniversary with some of the information that I'm about to share with you today. Um, and I did call the principal. He voiced some skepticism about it really being the 114th anniversary. He, um, you know, so it wouldn't be the 150th anniversary in 2017, which was the year before she had called. And so I set out to prove him wrong. <laughs> and the Excelsior Lake Minnetonka Historical Society helped me. Because this is what um, Donna and Larry Hicks first came across when they started doing research for the 114th anniversary. They came across these notes from the Hennepin County Commissioner's meeting in, on October 7th, 1867, regarding what they were calling, or eventually called, the um, School District 98. And it, the, the settlers there were petitioning, asking for uh, the formation of a new school district comprising of school districts 53 and 54. And for those of you who are interested in this sort of thing, um, when land was first platted in Hennepin County, and I imagine in many different counties, they picked where the schools would be um, in each section, or they called them school district. And they kind of reserved an acre of land for the school. They had it all planned out. However, the settlers didn't I assume follow their plan exactly like they wanted, and places would get settled, and it wouldn't be convenient for the kids to walk all the way to that acre way up in the corner of the section. And so settlers would have to petition to have the school in a different spot, and perhaps combine some of the districts. So that's what they were doing, I assume. Um, but I tell you, this doesn't really prove, right, that they formed a school, that they hired a teacher, uh, or held anything, they just they uh, just asked, and it was allowed for them to um, form a new school district. Uh, I call this my second point of evidence. This is Josephine McCarty. It was noted that in a book called The History of Hennepin County, some of you may have heard of it, it's a very important historical document for uh, Hennepin County, and there's an article by a, a friend of some of yours, Lydia D. Ferguson Holtz. And the article actually shares a lot about Clear Spring School when it was first formed, um, wonderfully. Uh, but it said that the first teacher was a 16-year-old woman by the name of Josephine McCarty uh, of the, the school in the area. And also West uh, Hennepin Historical Society had uh, confirmed that too. Of course, this picture is later, taken later in life. Uh, she, taught for a few, she taught for a few years. She visited uh, Lydia Ferguson in her home, because Lydia was also a teacher on and off at, in the Plymouth district, so they were friends. Um, but after teaching for a few years, she married a Stubbs, which is why, of course, I could contact the West Hennepin Historical Society uh, about her. But was that correct? Was she really 16 in 1967? I said she was born in 1851. Well, the Historical Society helped me confirm um, through an internet search for headstones, uh, grave sites, that she was born in 1851. But also, I was able to find, with help of the Chanhassen Historical Society, uh, 1860 records of the town of Chanhassen residents, and um, Josephine and her family are here. There's her father. There's Josephine, she was nine in 1860. And if you do the math, she was uh, definitely about 16 in 1867. And by the way, Josephine took the job as a teacher to help her widowed mother Harriet Thompson McCarty after her father Timothy McCarty died in the Civil War at the Andersonville Prisoner of War Camp. Who's heard of the horrors of that place? Yeah, interesting, interesting information. So, um, 
third point of evidence, I was uh, able to look at some of the archives of the Minnetonka School District. And they have a record book that I found that lists in 1870, Josephine as being 20 years of, of age, and it doesn't necessarily mean that she was going to school there. They would just list the kids that were potentially old enough up to about age 20 to go to school. They had a list of that so they could compare how many were actually going to school, I think. Um, she's listed as 20 years old in 1870, which again would put her to be 16 in 1867, about that. So that supports that she was 16, um, and um, I have, we have the evidence that she was the first teacher of, school, of the school organized in the area in 1867. And so I think that in 1981, when it was first thought Clear Springs was celebrating their 100th, they wasn't, they wasn't, they weren't. It really was the 114th anniversary. There really was no room for skepticism from the principal any longer. He'll be showing up later this evening so you can make sure that he'd stand corrected. And Donna, Larry, we showed him. So that was how I got started, yeah. But then we went on, we go on to learn a little bit more about the school. And let me help you with this map. Again, this is an 1888 map. Um, but according, again, to Lydia Ferguson, the first school in this area was not able to be seen very well here, but it was right here on what is Pleasant View Road. Okay, what we're looking at here is um, 101 heading south to Chanhassen. There's Vine Hill Road. There's Covington. This is the town line, but there's no road there yet. You'll also notice there's no extension of 101 to Covington. Not yet. All right, and, but this was 101. It will become 101. So this is how the road used to go. And every time my poor kids ride in the car along here with me on Covington, I say, you know, this is really an old road. This is fascinating. <laughs> yeah, yeah, ma. So the school first uh, meets, according to Lydia Ferguson Holtz, in Nicholas Zimmer's log cabin um, that was available. And, um, you know, I have, it's wonderful. I have found in every photo I show you tonight, I have the names of the students. And so I want to ask you, should I read the names quickly out loud to you to see if you recognize names? Yeah. Okay, so I will. If the night gets long, just have me stop. But we know, according to Lydia, that um, Ms. McCarty's pupils at first were Kate Gerhardt and Christ, um, uh, sorry, Zimmer, okay, for how handy, they were close to school. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, Kate Gerhardt and Chris Cordell. And the Cordells, uh, this is Simon and, his, Simon and his brother Chris, or Christ, they had property right next to each other. Nick Melkier went to school, very handy and uh, Barney Zimmer, along with some other kids who had to walk further to school, um, including kids, the Sealer kids, Ohm kids, moms, and Peters, and, and others. And one of the others was Mary Kokish. You probably recognize that name. We know this because Sister Marie Charles, who was born Lucy Kokish, attended Clear Springs schools from 1918 to 1926. And you're gonna hear from her more throughout this talk. But um, she and her parents and her aunts and uncles all attended Clear Spring School. Different buildings, but Clear Spring School. And the, by the way, they lived on their farm about two miles from the school, um, well, where the school ended up. Um, but they lived on Clear Springs Road. They had their farm there. I'm not even sure what it was called that then. Um, so. During the 114th anniversary, Sister Marie Childs came and talked to kids at school, and she shared that her Aunt Mary, who was the oldest, only went to school through third grade, probably between 1868 and 1871, so she was in this building. She then went to do housework for a family in Excelsior after third grade, right, a while ago. So, in 1872, they decided they needed to move out of the log cabin. Again, Lydia Ferguson Holt's article in the History of Hennepin County helps us know about this important next step. And the um, Cordells basically donated uh, some property to have a school uh, built for them. 
uh, built on, uh, on. And Lydia wrote, Simon Cordell donated a half acre of land near his brother's house by the roadside on the southeast corner of section 36, so we know exactly where it was. And so long as the schoolhouse should stand there, then he wanted his property back, I guess. Their families and relatives having at that time the majority of the children. So it made sense. And let's uh, see where that is. That is at the corner of Vine Hill and Covington. There's houses now there, of course. That was where they actually put up a building. And I need to thank Gary Keeker, or Kiker, I'm not sure if I'm saying that right. He, does anyone know who he is? He used to create the Sweetwater Neighborhood um, newsletter, Silver Lake Association newsletter. And that's where I got some of this initial information from. And um, unfortunately, he passed away before I got to ask him further questions. And so did Donna. So, sidebar, don't wait. <laughs> don't wait to ask those important questions. But a, school, a new school building must have been built since 10 years later, according to the County Superintendent of Public Instruction's 1882 report, um, Purgatory Springs School, it was, it was called then, uh, met in a framed wooden schoolhouse valued at about $300. And on these reports, they say whether it's a framed building or a log building or a brick building. You had three choices. And so we knew that they had actually, were, it's likely they had built a building, not just put up a, another log cabin or something. There are the Cordells, again, a little later in life. And an 1879 map, Mr. Cordell is showing you, um, noted the school here. Um, again, the Zimmers property was down here. And by the way, the Zimmers and Cordells and other families from the area are buried cemetery at the historic St. Hubertus Church in Chanhassen. You can go on the grounds now and thank them for their donations to the education in the area. In 1882, sorry, that's running off the page there, they had 32 scholars in the winter term and 16 in summer. The teacher was paid $35 for a three-month term, and that included room and board. Um, the state of Minnesota annual report, uh, cover shown here, um, said that the pay um, yeah, was included room and board in a nearby home. The school received from school fund liquor licenses and one mill of school tax, um, a total of $202.70 for that year. That was their budget. Uh, so who knows what a mill is? What's the mill? What's a mill rate or millage? Okay. Anybody? All right. I had to look this up too. This it is the rate that uh, the state uses to calculate property tax liability. Um, it's sometimes referred to as a millage tax. A mill is one thousandth or so of dollar. Um, basically, it's. Uh, the property in property tax term tax terms is equal to one dollar of tax for each one thousand of property assessment and don't ask me what it is now <laughs> and how it's calculated um, but a few little bits other bits of data the school paid that year for wood for heat and school supplies thirty six dollars and thirty five cents for the for the year um, two people graduated James Sieber and Carol I'm sorry Carson Mann and again, at the time of the 114th anniversary, Sister Marie Charles again, born Lucy Kokish, she shared that my father, Charles Kokish, who was the youngest of nine children, went through fifth grade, probably between 1882 and 1887. He had a copy of an arithmetic book and a reader, which were well protected on one of the top shelves in our pantry. My mother, Annie Pika Kokish, uh, told how she would cry at recess time if she had not been called on to recite or read and she attended Clear Springs from 1884 to 1890. Um, she was the oldest, so she probably had to stay home to help quite a bit on the farm. And so she may not have been the best reader or reciter. Um, so, and by the way, now just three years after this, there were twice as many students, up to 61 students. Um, but only 20, about 20 attended regularly. And that was an ongoing problem. Uh, people would sign up for their kids but for school, but they wouldn't come to school or they'd realize they need them at home. I'm not sure what happened. So 
By 1886, enrollment was continuing to grow. They were up to about 60 students, and they knew a larger school was needed. And so the Dvorak family donated some land for another school, and they moved again. And so you can see them there, uh, at the spot where the three is. And that is um, where the warehouse now is, across from the current Clear Spring School on Highway 101. All right, that's where they were at. And they built uh, a new school. But the bigger, a bigger school was probably needed because at that time, um, education was for a certain length of time was made compulsory in the state of Minnesota in about 1885. Um, Lydia Ferguson Holtz said the majority removed their school into section 31 upon an acre, acre of ground donated by the Dvorak family. They have built a modern house without bonding either the District 98 or their respective townships. So Lydia was very proud of them. But a special tax of 3.9 mills was collected uh, for a total of $342.83 uh, on top of the usual one mill that they required regularly, um, which was another $89.78. And this school cost $518 to build. The school had just one room, a basement, and of course an outhouse. Later on, they put an auditorium um, uh, in the basement with a small stage. It just amazes me that I'm able to tell you all of these little details. So I, it might be a little boring, but I am so proud of a country, and especially a state, and people would take the time to document all this. And maybe some people don't care, but I think it's fascinating. And I'm really glad that they did document it, because it helps us appreciate, I think, what we have now. The teacher um, here in this uh, photo is either Miss Hattie Westberg or Miss Hattie Harrison. I see it differently in different places. I'm not sure. And I haven't dug in. If anybody has any information about that, do let me know. Um, let's see, there were about 61 students enrolled, and I think most of them are here. I haven't counted. Some of the, um, uh, the school and the site were valued after it was built at $700. So um, the contract with the teacher said that she shall use her best endeavors to preserve it in good condition, the schoolhouse and premises connected with it, also the apparatus and furniture there to belonging, and also all books and records provided by the school board, and agrees to build the fires and sweep the floors. <laughs> uh, the annual meeting of, uh, in 1889, the school officers were Frank Dvorak, uh, chairman, Charlie Schmiedel, treasurer, and Thomas Ohm, clerk. A seven month long school term was voted upon commencing in November. So they might have been kind of progressive at the time. Uh, let's see, some of the students that you see there are kids from the Ladkey family, spelled H-L-A-D-K-Y. Um, kid, Harrison kids, Dvorak kids, Klavacek kids, and the teacher, Miss Hattie Westberger Harrison, or whatever her name was at the time. All right, so what's happening in 1895? By then, the annual report to the superintendent of public instruction tells us that they still have about 60 students, but the average daily attendance is still low, only about 21. Um, a Mr. W.H. Levan earned $40 a month. The school was up to eight, mean, 18, I'm sorry, eight months long. The regular school levy was up to two mills and textbooks were now loaned per a state law uh, in 1893 to the students. 1908, at the, during the turn of the century, the school population was graphic, growing rapidly. So in August 1908, a special meeting was called to approve a one-room addition to the school. And Mrs. Frank, Anna Dvorak, again donated an additional acre of land. And along with the addition, the school tax was boosted, I think maybe just for one year, to eight mil, mills, not million, <laughs> mills. Um, there were about 50 kids now attending regularly. So they were finally getting some good attendance. The um, A. Peterson and Company was awarded the job of building the addition for $695. Now, if you're good with numbers, you remember that's more in just 10 years than they paid for the original building. Um, but they did the painting and they threw in two blackboards to boot. All right, 
This is the earliest photo I have of the school. This photo was taken from the 30s, of course, not 1908. And, um, but you can see the old school point, you know, the old part of the building. They've kind of framed in the porch. And then this bump out is all the addition. Uh, so in this photo, we have Lottie Pashina, Victor Carlson, Margaret Foley, Dory Renan, Rose Huber, Hattie Pika, Ethel Seeler, Vincent Hannes, Ellen Bren, and Harriet Playhall. It's been fun for me to see the street names, of, you know, and relate to the students that I see in these photos. And the teacher is Mildred Swedenborg, who was the teacher for a long time in the 30s. Speaking of teachers, um, this is, I think, one of the Westbrook sisters that was written on the back of it. I think it's Lillian Westberg, taken during the 30s. But I've included this photo because supposedly she was one of the three Westberg sisters who taught at Clear Springs um, throughout the early part of, of the century. They live nearby. Some of you know the Westberg Farm on Excelsior Boulevard. The barn, a barn is still there on the property. It's owned by the city now. Um, near the entrance to Purgatory Park, and they were popular teachers. And it is said that they increased the class enrollment and forced the approval of the addition to the one-room school. Has anyone, does anyone know anything more about this? Uh, heard anything? I'd love to know more, so if you come across anything, let me know. And you know, prior to this time, uh, kids were all just in one room, and I've learned that they kind of help, the older ones help teach the younger ones, and they just worked from group to group. The teachers just moved from group to group. But once they added on to the school, they were able to have a, an upper and lower um, grades, or they called the upper one advanced. And Hattie Westberg was a lower grade teacher, and Alice Reed was the teacher for the upper grades. Um, teachers definitely started um, classifying students and broadening the curriculum to include things like history and geography. And they made very careful records of where a student ended at a term in each topic and where they needed to pick up. Uh, I, yeah, I kind of wish things were like that now. <laughs> All right, and I, I learned so much about when I was doing this research about how you really need to be careful and double check what you hear. Because the school at this time was not on this side of the road. It was, it, it was on this side of the road. It is now on this side of the road, but it was here at this time on this 1913 um, Hennepin County plat map book that I found with the help of the, at the Hennepin County Historical Society. So be careful when you're doing your research. Um, so at this time, the, there was only like one set of common school books. It was the reader, the basic reader. There was really not much else. Um, kids achieved and moved up in levels as they were able to work through and understand each of the readers. At this time, there were five. The fifth reader was at the highest achievement. Do any of you have one of those basic reader books? Not that it was yours, I'm not saying, right? Right? Because then we went on to use basic readers even, you know, I used them in kindergarten too, but we had other books. Um, each po student possessed a slate. If you don't know what that is, ask your grandpa uh, or grandma and which they carried with them. Um, discipline may have been a factor about this time for the school board passed um, in the early days a, a motion that, that parents had to pay for all the damage and breakage of property by the children at school. <laughs> and later that was amended to include only property which was broken intentionally. <laughs> right, things happen with the kids. Um, but I did notice that not many teachers stayed more than one term at this time. So there was no transportation, of course. Who didn't have transportation to school? Even in the winter when it was cold? Anybody? Okay, a few of us? Yeah. <laughs> oh, yes. Kids walked from up to three miles away to Clear Springs School, for sure. Well, see the divorce. Oh, they were close. I think they're, they're not, um, Yeah, coming to 101, exactly. That's where we're at, right here. Yes. Mm -hmm. And Bartholotic lived up 
<laughs> oh, not far. So she was, wasn't too bad. Did you uh, repeat it? Yeah, she, had, she knew someone who lived just a few doors down from the Dvorak's, and she walked to school. So it wasn't too bad for her. Now, Sister Marie Charles uh, uh, and, her, and her family, they lived two miles away from this building where this was. And she shared, again, during the 114th anniversary, that um, in the five, six years that she went to school there, she only got a ride to school about five times. And they didn't stay home for neither cold nor snow, she said. Sometimes when there was a blizzard, someone would come to get them with the horses and sleigh. But those few rides that they got in the bobsled or later in a Ford touring car during heavy rain was it. They walked. Um, she also shared some other stories. They, they formed a club, and anyone who wanted at school and anyone who wanted uh, to could pay two or three pennies a week, and that bought hot chocolate at school. Um, and for those students who had to walk, three miles to school, they were happy to have a cup of hot chocolate. And she said that each week two students cooked, two helped clean the blackboards, two washed dishes and swept the floors and so on. So they and she felt like they were very proud to keep their school clean and neat. Um, and I, I really want to thank the Kokish family in which Sister Marie Charles was a part of. Um, just as I was giving up on doing some of my research, they arrived in my life with a stack of uh, paper, uh, papers that documented the history of this area and their family history that tied up so many loose ends. It, it was really wonderful, and including were these report cards of Louis Kokish's. Uh, they really tied a lot together. I got to see who the teachers were um, at these times. Um, this is uh, 1909, I believe it says, 1910, and it's running off the here, but 1915. Lillian Westberg, Lillian Westberg again, and Harriet, I think, Play Hall, is how we say her names. So at least by 1909 at Clear Springs School, um, they had report cards. And the younger students were graded on, if you can't see, reading, spelling, penmanship, language, and numbers. Um, they also noted how many days absent, tardy, you can see there at the bottom. And they also got a grade for a deportment. Was anyone here ever graded for a deportment? You're all clear on what deportment means. Anyway, Principal Carpenter just walked in. If you don't know, ask him. In the report, of course, 100 is considered perfect, 90 excellent, 80 good, and 70 fair. Not much has changed. Um, grade achievement levels were also noted, although they were never related to a kid's age. And here, too, I, I kind of wish we'd go back to that. Um, other than that, really not much has changed. The older students were uh, also studied and were graded in arithmetic, geography, grammar, U.S. history, and you can see something called general lesson. Don't know what that is. And the most inter interesting thing is that this time a student could test out of going to eighth grade by passing examinations given by the Minnesota High School Board, um, which Louis Kokish did in 1916 according to his family records. So he was probably thrilled he didn't have to go to eighth grade. Where did he go then after that? He didn't go to school, I'm sure. He was done. He was on top of school. Well, you could go to high school at that time in Minneapolis, and I, I, should, I don't know for sure, but I think that Excelsior High School might have started already. Yeah, thank you. Sorry? Deep Haven. Deep Haven. What years? Oh, I think Excelsior was probably 1880s. Oh, 90? Scott, help me out. I don't know. Scott, um, <laughs> 1892 was the first graduating class Thank you. Excelsior. Okay. Okay. So they would have to go to Excelsior probably to high school. Yeah, and not many people went. How many people graduated? Not many, huh? In 1892 from Excelsior. So I'd like to talk next about the bell, the school bell. About 1912, a bell was purchased for Clear Springs School, thank you, so that all the children could be called to school by this bell. And what you see here is a replica of the catalog that they probably looked at to purchase this bell. That is likely the, the bell that they bought for, that, for the school, from what I understand from um, uh, Don and Larry Hicks. It was set in the school building cupola on the roof using a team of horses, a rope, and a pulley. Easy. Sister Marie Charles explained when she was, again, interviewed around 
uh, the 114th anniversary um, by the Lake Minnetonka sailor, that the bell was the local timepiece, signaling to the start of day, sorry, signaling the start of day and calling farmers in from the fields at noon for lunch. It also rang on special occasions. She recalls the bell ringing to proclaim the end of World War I, after which the students gathered to sing the Star Spangled Banner and then were dismissed. I was in first grade, she said, November 11th, 1918, when word spread that the armistice was signed. The big boys rang and rang the school bell that day. And around 1973, the PTA discussed a display area for the 1912 Clear Springs Bell that was discovered at the warehouse. So thank goodness someone thought to put it in the corner of the new warehouse, which I'll explain to you, you know, about that a little more. Um, so the, uh, William Marquardt here in 1975 built this belfry, and it is in the courtyard of the school today. Has anyone ever heard this bell ring? Not you. <laughs> no? We'll have to do that, Kurt. Okay. Uh, next, I'd like to show you a picture which is of uh, the 1924 advanced room students, the older students at the school. Our friend, uh, Sister Marie Kokish, sorry, Sister Marie Charles, Lucy Kokish, should be in this picture. I'm not sure why she isn't, um, but she should be because she should have been in the advanced room at this time. But in this picture is Dorothy Wilderwing, Rosella Schumann, Adeline Hannes, Mary Pashina, Miss Molly Miller, the teacher, um, Elmer Hlavacek, Libby Hannes, Evelyn Westberg, Evelyn Hannes, Evelyn Wildering, Alice Pika, and then in front, Gertrude Barnvold, John Wilwerdine, that's how we say it, Raymond Karasek, George Shimmick, Mary Pika, and Dorothy Harabek. Uh, by the way, Dagny Barnvold was absent that day. <laughs> so don't know where she is. Um, and at this time, uh, or for the anniversary, I'll, Sister Marie Charles shared other memories of Clear Springs School. And I thought it'd be interesting to, if you would, raise your hand when I share this memory, if you experience this during grade school too, okay? So she said, in our day, hot lunch was prepared in front of the classroom on a two burner kerosene stove. One of the big girls would cook. We took turns bringing food from home and would partake of soup, cocoa, and spaghetti. Sometimes we had cooked rice with fruit sauce. Yeah, I'm gonna try that um, with my kids. Nobody? Yeah. Go home and try that. Yeah. She said the drinking pail was on the back shelf. There was a common shared dipper, which we dr all drank from. On this shelf was a basin where we would wash our hands after using the outdoor plumbing. Again, probably using all the same water. This was not long after the influence of 1918. The only library books we had in the front of the big, uh, big, I'm sorry, the only library books we had were in the front of the big room. There was a small cove with a glass encased shelves and very few books. Think of the books we have now. Um, if you forgot your lunch or your books, there was no such thing as calling your mother. The school didn't have a phone. Did your grade, did anyone have a grade school without a phone? No. You got, okay, yeah, we had a few or they wouldn't let you use it. Uh, there was an old pump organ in the big room. Later on, a music teacher was hired to come once a week. We didn't really have a gym, and we really didn't need one, as most of us did a lot of walking, since she, had, she would walk four miles a day there and back to school. She also shared recollections um, about an annual school picnic. One picnic in particular was held in Westberg's pasture by Purgatory Creek. And I know just the spot, you know? It's beautiful over there. It was a beautiful shady spot. Each family would bring food. The school would bring gallons of ice cream. For every year, the whole school would have also a half a day free to walk three or four miles to pick Dutchman's britches, violets, cowslips, and wake robins. We would get hot and tired before we reached the quaint log bridge that we crossed to this paradise of flowers. Nowhere have I seen such a vast stretch of thick foliages, foliage as we have enjoyed in that particular spot. Where is that now? Whose house is on that spot now? All right, other highlights were practicing for weeks and weeks for the Christmas pageant. 
and going to the state fair. They'd get a free ticket and they would be able to t display some of their own school projects. Um, so she had a lot of great stories to share. And I didn't see a lot of hands, so things must have changed. The WPA um, uh, era, what does WPA stand for? I do have a teaching degree. <laughs> Works, projects, Yes, and, and sometimes also, uh, or I think later, Works uh, Progress Administration. Um, years that it was in action was 1935 to 1943, and it was very fortunate for Clear Springs School because they got running water and indoor washroom facilities at their school mm -hmm. building. And this is what the school, we think, looked like about that time. Um, this photo was not dated, but the wa I think the girls and boys' washrooms were on either side of the building. And so Larry Hicks, um, who helped again plan the 114th anniversary celebration, told a story at that time about how a teacher would use the new toilet as a form of punishment. I'm not going to say any more about that. <laughs> not recommended. But during the WPA years, they, it, it also signaled the beginning of the hot lunch program when the old coal bin was remodeled to serve as a kitchen, which I'm guessing is this room, uh, or at, kind of, that's where they would dump the coal down into the basement, um, guessing. But the, she said, or it's noted that the National School Lunch Act was signed by President Harry Truman in 1946. And so Clear Springs students got hot lunch. Here is a diploma from 1941, Hennepin County, is who would grant the diploma for graduating from eighth grade and uh, the Hladke family shared uh, this with us. The Hladkes uh, had the school where Scenic Heights School is now. And uh, we also know that rural schools in the area had a combined eighth grade graduation and this year it was at the Excelsior Amusement Park. So what fun. Um, this is a little reading certificate they get from Hennepin County Library if they read all the home, all the books on the home reading list by eighth grade. And graduated in uh, this year was Lillian Dvorak, Helen Ladke, Helen Pika, Vivian Greenwald, Thomas Peters, Phyllis Stewart, and Donna Hicks, but that's Larry's sister, not his wife. His uh, wife, Donna, who um, I worked with uh, went to school in Bloomington, grew up in Bloomington. Here's a graduation brochure from 1942. And so just five people graduated from Clear Springs School. Um, at Richfield had a whole bunch of folks. The Earl Brown District Center had a larger school population, but they'd all get together in Excelsior, way out in Excelsior. I have uh, proof here that in 1942, they had a PTA. Does anyone have any evidence or know of PTA existing before that time, at least at Clear Springs School? It, they may have, I don't know, this is the first evidence I have of that, but they helped put on a play called Curse You, Jack Dalton, for, with the students, and enrich the students' lives as the PTA does, or PTO now, does today. And rolling on in history, we're getting there, in 1949, the, this brochure, and I've just kind of showed you bits of it, was sent to all the box holders, and it says, mothers, fathers, citizens, you can't argue with the stork. After World War II, all the schools in the area and around the country were, of course, overcrowded. Um, many of the schools were still just eight grades, so students had to go to Excelsior or Deep Haven or Hopkins to attend high school now. So the area school boards met and discussed plans to merge all the small rural schools in the area and build just one new high school for everyone. Clear Springs at that time had 95 students uh, when this brochure was sent out, but really liked the art. That's so fun. In the brochure was a poem. There was an old woman who lived in a shoe. She had so many children she didn't know what to do. So one by one she sent them to school to learn to be citizens and follow the rule. But the Minnetonka area being such a popular place, there's great need for more classroom space. You can help us solve this problem, please note, if on March 15th you remember to vote. <laughs> so people put a lot of work into that, these brochures. Now you just get an email. And in 
1949, they vote, uh, I can't quite see the number, but 2,213 people voted and it was overwhelmingly uh, voted to merge. Um, you'll see, they also created this um, flyer in that uh, brochure that, you know, many of these buildings are gone or are used for some other purpose, uh, but we've lost some of these. Does anyone here recall the merger? We're we getting, getting closer. Okay. And uh, uh, so it was moved and seconded. Well, be, be there, I was going to say thereafter, um, Clear Spring School, that building housed um, various grades, but never again all eight grades. They sent, during the first year of the merger, it was necessary to send the kindergartner, first and second grade youngsters to uh, Clear Spring to Deep Haven to the high school building, so they compiled all of the primary grader, graders there. Um, Excelsior, of course, was the designated high school. And because kids weren't walking to their local school, they had to get a bus. And that's what these notes are all about. Um, it was moved and seconded by Mr. Fromms that John Novotny be engaged as janitor of the Clear Spring School, and in addition, as the driver of the bus, so carried. Um, and then they still continued to talk about what bus to buy. And um, so they did eventually settle on an international brand model from Mason Motor Company. How much do you think it cost for a new school bus in, where are we, 1949? $700. $700? Okay, maybe a little more than that. $4,947.44. So quite an expense. And what's interesting is that later, a few months later, this, at the school board meeting, they must have realized that it was pretty, that driving the school bus wasn't all it was cracked up to be because they had to pay, start paying John Novotny another $25 um, a month to, to add that duty of driving the bus. Um, does anyone here think they rode bus, the bus that John Novotny drove? No, nope. yeah. Okay, here's a photo in 1952 of all the kids going to school in, this, in our Clear Spring School building. They all look pretty big because they're third through eighth graders. Again, the first and second graders went, well, that year to Excelsior. But this year, the school, uh, their, the insurable value of the school was 15200 Grounds purchase price was 5000 and the equipment worth uh, 39, uh, about $3,900. And the teacher is Marion Jorgensen in this picture. Okay, she knew her. And during the next school year at Clear Springs, students in grades one through six all went to Excelsior. And this building was only used for kindergarten. Um, and there were two kindergarten classes with two different, uh, no, 146 kindergartners with two different teachers uh, that year. So does anyone here remember maybe attending or having someone attend then? What year are you in? No, I'm, I'm in 1952 to 53. Yep. I've heard from a few people. Um, one lady wrote me via Facebook that she remembered the play kitchen in the corner, the wood floors where they did a lot of activities, and a huge, to me, metal swing set, and uh, uh, wood teeter-totter outside I got dumped off that a couple times, she said. And um, another person remembers music classes in the basement in this building. So after more than 60 years in this building, in 1955, they realized we need not just a few classrooms, we need a whole new building uh, here for the district so that we could again house at least K through six in their own neighborhoods, and that was the movement at that time. And so they purchased from the Dvorak family uh, for $8,056, a, a, another property, about 10 acres, um, and they purchased this from I, what I believe were the children of the Dvorak family that originally donated the property across the street for the school. So quite a legacy. And the new school site is, was just across the street. They are across that old native trail, which is where we started. And that's where it is today. Here is the uh, dedication booklet for the new school. Um, anybody remember who was the first principal of this new 12 classroom brick building in 1958? 
His name was L. Flemmer, and since then there have been nine other principles. And then, I just heard this story from someone tonight to support this, but just a year after the new school had opened, the, the principal then, uh, his name was James Carey, he asked the teachers to check and make sure that all the students in their classrooms were registered. And if they weren't, make sure to report their names. And there must have been a lot of unregistered students because just uh, a few days later, he was writing the parents of the second, third, and fourth graders to say that there were more students enrolled than they expected. And so to gain space, they had to reopen two classrooms in the old building. And um, so uh, there was a second grade class and a combined third and fourth grade class across the street. And um, you, someone here had actually experienced that. Sharon, thank you, yeah. So she was in that classroom. Do you remember having to cross the street to go to lunch or the gym? You did. Oh, yeah, gym in the Did you? Okay. Um, some, apparently some also went across the street and, and, and for lunch too because there wasn't really any good lunch facilities there. Hmm. Easy to forget some things that long ago. But um, the parents must have needed some convincing because also in the letter he said, the old Clear Spring School was completely painted outside and, it's, and at present is being renovated in the interior. And people knew that, <laughs> that it was old and it wasn't um, the best. Does anybody remember, do you remember sharing what they called the old building? They gave it a nickname. I was in the second grade. Yeah, yeah. I don't remember that. They called it the Annex, which I kind of wonder if that was just sort of a fancy name to get, make it sound better, you know. But uh, that's what they had to do for a while. One thing I do remember is we were not allowed to walk in a certain area of the classroom because the floor was unsafe. <laughs> Did you hear that in the back? Not allowed to walk in one area? Of the, which couldn't have been a very big area because the floor was unsafe. Yeah, no wonder the parents needed convincing. Yeah. Throughout the 60s, there was so much growth in the area um, and lots of teacher turnover and they, had, they struggled to house all the students um, to meet, in order to meet the exploding student population. Eventually, they had to add Scenic Heights School and then the old school was just used to store supplies. And finally, in 1966, the old school was deemed even inadequate for storage. Does anyone remember them taking it down? Were you there, bud? Were you helping them take it down? <laughs> yeah, it sounds, so, totally sounds like a project you'd like. Okay, so uh, the 78-year-old school house was torn down to make room for a 78 square foot 7,800 square foot concrete storage, warehouse, and shop. And thank goodness someone thought to hide the bell in there. Yeah, yeah. So we've covered basically about 100 years of the history of the school, and you can see that I'm not just talking about a building. I'm talking about um, a community wanting to do the best for their kids and struggling and not always agreeing. And it's expensive and messy. Um, but I think it's a, it, it's a story that should be told and everyone in the community should be proud of. And uh, well, we, we can't stop without talking about the totem pole. Some folks remember the totem pole. Um, so I'd like to play the game, Who Remembers, uh, if anyone, because this picture was taken from the 70s. So maybe we're getting there and somebody will remember the totem pole. We got, a, okay, we got a couple. Um, this was a Boy Scout project, I think, just as the school was opening. The Boy Scouts very proudly, um, I, I heard from the son of the Scoutmaster, we were very proud of that totem pole and we worked really hard on it. And my sons will tell you that this, these days that would likely be considered cultural appropriation mom and not appropriate. So, um, but some kids didn't like the totem pole because they, if they missed the bus, they were told to stand by the totem pole, I've heard, until someone came to pick you up and you were, so it was the totem pole of shame, I guess. Um, yeah, yeah, did, did that happen to you? Oh, I remember it. He remembers it, okay. Um, and regarding the 70s, I spoke to Superintendent Don Dreher, uh, who, who was a superintendent at that time, and 
you may also remember there was quite a bit of controversy surrounding Clear Springs achievement scores um, relative to the other schools in the, in the district and it became a major point of concern in the uh, uh, school board elections in 1971. Um, as he says, it's not an easy or fun story to recall, but eventually the achievement was brought up through several actions. You also might remember state funding was an issue in 1975. Um, the outstate, it's still happening today, the outstate districts just don't quite understand that equal money does not mean equal education. And um, there's also concerns about teacher contract negotiations. There were some challenges there. So you might remember some of that. Uh, we didn't start the fire, right? It goes on and on today. So that leads us to back to 1981 and the 114th anniversary. This postcard was created um, for the, to commemorate the anniversary, showing the three buildings. Of course, we did, don't have a photo of Mr. Zimmer's old log cabin. But it was designed and 500 were printed for $114.40 and they were sold for 30 cents a piece. 1981 just seems like yesterday to me, so uh, it's a pretty good deal. And um, there's Sister Marie Charles, our friend. She spoke to all the students at Clare Springs about her memories of the old school that I've been sharing with you this evening. Um, and at the 114th anniversary the, and the, the old ice cream social that was held uh, were any of you there? Nope. Okay. Well, then you missed it because they rang the bell. They rang the bell to celebrate. And the band played, there were square dancers, a puppet show, a raffle, historical displays from the Excelsior and Minnetonka, be fair, historical societies. And of course, Donna and Larry's had an exhibit um, of all the materials and information that they had collected. And a lot of those things and things I have collected are here tonight. If there's any questions you have afterwards or want to see some of the original uh, documents and or some things I just have copies of. So I started this presentation by telling you that I received a call from Donna Hicks asking me if I could help prepare for the 150th anniversary. The principal wasn't interested in an ice cream social. I never did ask you why. But um, I had a better idea. I wanted to share with everyone all of this information and the stories and memorabilia that Donna and Larry, Harry, Larry Hicks had gathered. And so my idea was to create a museum quality historical exhibit at the school. So we did that. And we used photos from the 1930s to uh, create real life size cutouts, as I called them, of the kids. So as children are walking uh, out to the playground, they're walking by kids that are about as tall as they are and who were on, uh, outside playing on the playground at Clare Springs School long ago. And you'll notice out here, it's a little hard to see, but here's the belfry, right, at, right outside the doorway of the exhibit with the old bell. And so here's another angle. We have the traditional museum type exhibit with some of the details that I've shared with you tonight there on the wall. And also a, a quote from Sister Marie Charles that I found in um, a thank you note that she wrote to Donna and Larry Hicks after all the events of the 114th anniversary. I've been pondering the meaning of Clear Springs. Now I see clearly that from humble beginnings, great things have sprung. And so that's why I thought we should tell this story. And thank again, thanks again to Donna and all of you.